sobering pleasure for me to introduce Klaus. I've known Klaus for about 43 years. So have so I. So sobering. So if you have yeah. <laughs> the same 43 years. The same 43 years. I think maybe even longer. Maybe even longer, that's true. Yeah, that's right. ICA we met long, long, long time ago. Yeah. Huh? I want to sit over there. Just goes to show how good my communication my study is for longevity. Just put it on the big words. I love the 44. Klaus began uh, his studies in design, and in fact has retained a, I think, a, uh, a little important interest in design throughout a long career in communication, but he shifted to communication research at the University of Illinois, and then when George Gerbner, who you heard of, <coughs> came to the University of Pennsylvania in 1964, Klaus accompanied him, although he wasn't yet finished with his PhD, uh, and when he finished his PhD, he remained on the faculty of Stanford where he's been ever since, and I arrived at 10 in 1968, which is when I first met Klaus. Neither of us was much different than the other one. Klaus is very well known, uh, and I suspect well known to many of you, for his important theoretical and methodological work in content analysis. You've heard of Krippendorf's something. <laughs> <laughs> Several of you have something, you know, one of those Greek letters, but uh, of you have tried. Uh, one of the things that always struck me about Klaus's work in content analysis is how just when you think you've got it right, he raises the bar a little higher uh, to make you uh, realize that it's more difficult than you thought and more complicated than you thought. His book on content analysis is very well known and very influential. In fact, won the ICA Fellows Book Award a few years ago. But Klaus's other work is more in the area of theory and uh, the construction of meaning, the construction of our understanding of the world, the relationship between language and discourse and communication, as well as information theory, cybernetic theory, and UCP winning awards around the world or being celebrated in, uh, in Latin America, in this case, in Bogota. Uh, and it's really a pleasure that he's alighted in uh, Los Angeles uh, to speak to us. So we can switch back to you. Yeah. 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 Uh, Meryl can switch you back to your talk. Yeah. Let me just say this this poster, this is an animation, but there's a real poster. It's about, about 25 feet high. And, um, and the Annenberg School decided to get that from there and it's hanging down in the lobby <laughs> from the top. Uh, if you know the Annenberg School East, from the top of uh, the staircase down in the floor, it's a huge poster. Well, this is actually, uh, you, you mentioned my earlier commitment to design, and, um, and that is part of my I could say, intervention I made in South America to introduce or promote what I call human-centered design. And that is actually uh, what I learned from communication. I brought back into design. And I'm trying to uh, say that design ought not to design functional objects, rather than uh, things that introduce practices in human, in human everyday life. And actually, now that Steve Jobs is on everyone's uh, television screen, he is kind of the model uh, of someone who doesn't care about technology, but the practices with technology, and that's kind of things that I was interested in, and made a, a kind of a, well, I could say an intervention in Bogota, and it was very uh, big, big event. Anyway, but I want to talk about something else, namely, I want to um, uh, to talk about discourse and um, and how I come to it, and my particular conception, and my outline. Roughly, I mean, I, first of all, I want to talk about on ignoring language, and I think we all are ignoring it, in my opinion. And then there are four different theories of language, and then what, when is conversation, and when conversation erodes into something else, and that is discourse, and then I talk about various elements of discourse, 
and then I'm giving some uh, some examples. I actually I, I give them probably on the way. And what I'm saying is not I'm not reporting on particular research, but I want to issue a challenge, a, a challenge that I hope at least a few people start thinking differently afterwards. And I, I hope that the questions that I'm getting are not just I doubt this or whatever, but you know just let's see what emerges. Okay. On ignoring language, I think one has to realize that all scholarly work is done in language. And the surprising thing is, if you look at your curriculum in communication, I do know the Annenberg one, nobody cares about language. This is to be most amazing. Now, wh why is that so? I think from the natural sciences, we inher inherit two illusions. The first one is that we could observe without being an observer. That means ex excluding us from that would be observed. And the second one is uh, the second one is actually um, that we can theorize the world as if the language, the nature of language, doesn't matter. Uh, when you look up the language, in, in language, language is a noun, and nouns designate objects. And uh, when one designates objects, then one can study these. One presumes one can study these objects as if they were isolated entities. And that's what linguistics does. And uh, there is also the notion that once one describes the object, there is one correct description. And this is, I think, very suspicious to me. Now then, another thing that one should realize, or you should realize, that we always talk about things. But talking about things, about the subject matter, means that the language that we speak is kind of in the background, is not recognized, is transparent. And I think th that is something we should, we should consider to be faulty, because we are speaking. Right? But the second part is that the speaker itself is not implicated. <coughs> if you make a statement about reality, the speaker is not implied. I mean, of course, one can say, I think that, etc., etc., and then the speaker is there. But otherwise, we always speak about things as if the speaker and the language spoken doesn't matter. Now, I think one should distinguish not just <coughs> one theory of language, but four. And uh, I, I now I'm shocking you probably for a big table of four different kinds of theories of language, and I don't want to go through all of them, but the first column, the abstract objectivist notion, and I'm using, a, a, to start out with, a, a categorization of F.C. Volosina, who who dis distinguished the abstract objectivist notion, which is, comes from Saussure, uh, Ferdinand de Saussure, who at some point said, you know, in order to study language, we have to look at the structure, not where it occurs, who speaks, just the structure. Mm -hmm. And that was a way of isolating an object, abstracting that object from everyday speaking, and then come up with, with theories about it. And so at that point, or in that connection, language is an, it's an autonomous system, a system of symbols that represent things, uh, as if this had nothing to do with, with the culture in which it emerges, with the speakers, etc., etc. The explanations are syntactic, semantic, and logic, and the validity criteria are very well known to you, or representational truth, and the reality that is constructed is kind of outside, uh, is, co is a consistent universe. Which, which is what is supposed to be represented by the autonomous system of language. And actually, and I'm, I'm, I'm ending up here with saying the discourse that promoted, to me the interesting part of it is, it was just not a linguistic abstraction. Linguists managed to isolate language from the rest of the world and study it as such. And that was supported culturally by two institutions. One is education. And education needed actually to, to teach something that could be put in easily in textbook, <coughs> normative in, in, in one particular language or culture. And so that lang uh, education supported that idea. And the other one is ad administration. And administrations require that, that people know exactly what they have to do. And therefore, they have to learn the language and learn how to, to interpret the language. Well, I, so this is going down one column, and I don't want to go to the others too much, but the individual subjectivist notion, some people call it a romantic theory of language, is a very different one, in which the language is not 
an abstract system outside rather than it's what the brain does, what is kind of the, the, um, the core of, uh, of humankind of the brain and that, that deals both in the direction of a psychological explanation or cognitive explanation in which the cognition is primary and language is kind of the, 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 the artifact maybe culturally refined over time etc but always the result of, of brain activity. And then comes the hermeneutic type of interpretation and uh, or, uh, no notion, and that is actually what I think much of sociology promotes when, when one thinks of that a text is an interpretation. Now, and then one asks, well, an interpretation is always of something. So that of something is then interpreted, and what comes out is actually another text. And then one has another interpretation. So the language is simply a system of interpretations of interpretations of interpretations. And that is, I think, the hermeneutic notion. The key concept is that of understanding, individual understanding. And actually, the criteria are largely social. For example, when you write a term paper, uh, you go to, go to the library and look at, at, at literature, and you interpret that. Now, the criteria for a correct interpretation is entirely social. Well, your, your professor has probably lots of things to do with it, but when you publish this, there are other people that say this is a correct interpretation or it's, or it's meaningless or far-fetched, whatever kind of term, but this is all social or cultural. What I myself am um, moving into is the kind of a dialogical conception of, uh, of language, and the, 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 the kind of conception really is that of, of conversation. Where, where they are, and we'll talk more about it. And, and to me, the medium is not representation, not expression, not, not interpretation, but rather than coordination of speech acts. When, when we are in a conversation, or in any, for me, a communication is largely one of coordination between people. And then, well, I will not go uh, too much down, but uh, to me, that is to me the entrance point for critical scholarship, that one, one has a way of not objectifying language, but rather than embedding language in the in everyday practices. I mean, I could talk much about this, but let me talk about when is com uh, conversation. And th there is a, this is interesting to me that from the outside, it looks very different than from the inside. <coughs> from the outside, the conversation analysts would probably agree that this is the interaction between uh, or communication between a small number of individuals. It's a common occurrence. It's accompanied by nonverbal uh, activities and has a beginning and end, and one can record it and uh, uh, extract rules for that. From the inside, I, mean, I would contend it looks very different. For example, there has to be, as a participant in a conversation, there has to be an acknowledgement or address and response to others. That, that means it, a, a conversation always maintains the possibility for participants to continue the conversation. And, and it coordinates understanding each other. I mean, understanding is important. And I don't mean understanding in the sense of sharing, but there comes at some often in, in conversation comes a point, okay, I understand what you're saying. Now, what that means is an, another issue. But the point is, is again, a speech act that occurs within conversation and it is actually some sort of a conversation shifter. When I say, I understand what you're saying, that's an invitation to go to another topic, and <coughs> not, not much more. But I think uh, important is to me that, that uh, in the conversation <coughs> organizes itself, or rather the participants are self-organizing. There is no outside influence. You can't orchestrate a co uh, conversation. That, that is already introduced, introducing another element. And then uh, it is irreversible. That means it's not repetitive. Now, for for conversation analysts, that would be an anathema because in order to establish real rules, you need that something repeats. But from the inside, it's never it's never repeats itself. And then one may drop out of conversation. So it looks like that the conversation is at an end. But the point of con a conversation, being in a conversation, is that you, in principle, could continue that conversation. In fact, when you can't continue it, it ends up either in war or in, in killing or whatever. The, the point of conversation is that it has actually no end, unless what one can study as conversation analysis. So I think, from my point of view, but, uh, but as an outside observer, you describe a conversation, you are bound to con describe a conversation very differently from how it appears from the inside. And I think conversation analysts are always from the outside and, and they cannot possibly get what it is to participate in.
So that's one. And I think there are lots of disruptions of conversation. And I think I have my notion of conversation is maybe a little bit ideal, uh, and for good reasons, and I will see why. But there are lots of disruptions that we know. For example, acoustic interferences. I was yesterday in a, um, uh, with, with other former uh, uh, graduates from the Annenberg School East in the dinner, and I said, you know, select a, restu uh, a restaurant where there is no noise. Because, in fact, noise is really killing any conversation. You have in Philadelphia, they are very good restaurants, but they are so packed with people, we cannot talk. And that is, you cannot do very much about it, except you can walk out and find another place. And then lack of understanding, I mean, that is very often studied, uh, and people talk about this in terms of uh, repair. Right? That when someone says, I don't want to understand you, that, is, that interrupts temporarily a good conversation, and then comes an explanation, then it goes on. It's well studied. Another thing interrupting the contributions by others. Now that, that becomes actually interesting from an institutional perspective. I mean, uh, you can say on the one side it's rude, or it's, 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 it's uh, showing some sort of element of power. But this, uh, this is, for example, in therapy, it's wrong. Uh, the, the therapist constantly says, no, don't, don't tell me about that. Tell me now about this. Or uh, that constant interruption, this is part of the institutional nature of therapeutic discourse or not responding to the contribution, simply let, leaving someone, ignoring someone. Right? So someone says something and nobody follows up on it. That is a typical disruption of, of conversation. Or addressing people, participants in categories. You know? Oh, you are a professor, or you are a student, or something. That, that already acknowledges no longer the individual, rather than the category of the individual in which someone uh, is participating. So I think these are all um, disruptions of the nature of dialogical inequality. Where, where dialogical inequality on conversation is that, that everyone has the potential of participating. It doesn't mean, again, it's from the outside, uh, there are lots of studies, for example, uh, we of, of faculty meetings or other conversations where one finds, for example, that men usually do more of the talking than women and all of these kind of things and then it comes a construction that it is an uh, issue of power. Uh, uh, that is an outside conception. From the inside, the question is really, is one is capable of contributing? And I often, for example, in faculty meetings, I don't say that much, but I have the potential to do that. And that potential, I think, is part of an important con uh, conversation. Then there are other ones that I think to me more, probably more important than the claiming to have possess uh, knowledge or expertise that others don't have. Once you can claim that, then you are already introducing inequality in the conversation that are very, very difficult to get rid of. No? Or then I I important is the invoking the voices of, uh, voices of absent others. No? When, for example, the Republicans say, Americans want this. Well, how do they know? You know, they, they, they claim the voices of others, and that is a question of who can claim more voices, and there comes a power struggle within uh, conversation, and that, that no longer, in my opinion, makes a conversation. Or speaking in the name of an institution, or an abstract idea, of you. I'm for family values, or I am for this and the other. No? Or finally, uh, is then speaking as an, as an officer, as a titular uh, representative of an office, then one doesn't speak really about oneself. Uh, it, what one is, uh, is uh, actually one speak, speech is uh, orchestrated, if you want, from the office in which one, that, that one occupies. And I think this is, in, at that moment, something like accountability is compromised, it's made difficult. That means you can't just ask, for example, I cannot easily, well, I do have the right and I often do ask my dean saying, uh, tell me why you do this. No? That is a request for an account. And uh, I think, you know, at some point one can do this, but not always. And when one, when one is not afraid to ask those kind of questions, then this is no longer a conversation in my opinion. And finally, I think it's deferring to other participants on what's suspending one's uh, willingness to hold people accountable. And this is the would yield to the authority of others. So now this is, these are the disruptions. And now my question to, to myself is, what does it do to a conversation when it is disrupted? Well, on the one side, one can, of course, repair certain kinds of things. Uh, insults can be, you know, not repaired, but at least 
one can talk about it and maybe one can eliminate something. Issues of understanding one can explain. But not everything is either repaired or uh, results in, 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 in some sort of a continuing of a conversation. So for me, I think discourse is kind of a continuum. It's on the one side, it's bounded by the ideal of conversation, and there is a possibility when there's something emerges of repair and going back, so to speak, to a conversation. On the extreme other side is computation uh, or mechanization. When, when you some of the way you uh, or routine type of discourses or interactions, one could say, they can be mechanized. And when you when you uh, talk uh, to to some uh, some in, in the telephone to some machine, that that is the kind of thing discourse that you can automate. Make. The discourses of interest to me is just what is in between these. And to me, I'm looking at discourses simply as constrained conversation. To which I might want to add is that that it is accepted as constrained conversation. So, and, and I think all of these, these uh, interactions that I mentioned, they are then basically accepted to in, in, in discourses, in formal discourses, whether it is in faculty meetings, or whether it's in the classroom, or whether it is in, in business uh, organization, the boardroom. These are all accepted kind of constraints on conversation and people uh, act in that. Now, I, I want to uh, uh, talk about this in, in terms of six kind of components. And the components is first, and, and I will move stepwise through that, that, that I think all discourses manifest themselves in the artifacts that they are creating, you know, including text. I mean, I'm, I'm not I'm saying including text, because there are other artifacts, and I will talk about this. Then there are also, there is always a, co a speech community, a discourse community. I think I should like to say discourse analysis is actually uh, an analysis of text beyond the, the level of sentences. And I, I, that is, to me, I think, far too limited, because it excludes actually those who work with, with, um, with the discourse, um, with, with the textual matter or with other things. So that is the discourse community. Then there are always institutions involved. That means every discourse community institutionalizes certain kind of routine, uh, recurring practices. And then, uh, then the, uh, an important part is that discourses maintain their own identity by drawing boundaries around themselves. And I, I will talk some about some of these boundaries. Or think about physics. You know? I mean, the physics is a is a discourse to me. Uh, physics is um, uh, very disciplined. Uh, there is a discourse community of physicists, and the physicists themselves patrol, control. Uh, police, if you want, who can speak as a physicist. Of course, you can have crack uh, physicists uh, talking about it. They are not allowed to physic meet meetings uh, in the, among physicists. So I think physicists or any discourse uh, controls its own memberships, its <coughs> own boundary. And I think this is an important feature uh, that, that uh, if we want to talk about. And then I think every discourse needs to justify themselves these are the other discourses or these are the other people that are materially important to them. Yeah. And finally, they must somehow work. I mean, I will not go into great details about this, but, but it's, it's not just a, a mental job. It's something when you deal with artifacts, they must work. Yeah. So now I want to talk now about the, the various these features that I just mentioned. And the first one is the artifacts that, um, that every discourse creates. Yeah. I think the important is to realize that artifacts, or I think about material artifacts, have uh, some sort of a endurance that enable actually the members of the discourse community to maintain a certain kind of reading of that. Right? Like a text, a book. A book usually lasts longer than the, the life of the author. And, um, and when you go in a library, uh, it's an amazing collection of artifacts that have a physical quality. I mean, they're on bookshelves. Um, or now if you want a digital. But the point is actually they can be reread by many and they have some endurance beyond the life of individuals. It's not just um, uh, <coughs> a, 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 a verbal kind of culture. You know? So and I think uh, this is important for the discourse community to maintain some sort of a stability, is to do something with its artifacts. So typical artifacts are, of course, <coughs> vocabularies, grammar, and metaphors but also text, of course, a whole body of text. But then one, one thing that I wanted to mention, uh, which you probably don't 
don't, uh, or many people don't agree with that. And then you data. Uh, data are also uh, a sort of artifact. And they are created. I mean, uh, most people think they, data are facts, you know? but, but facts are created. If you think of uh, making an experiment, well, the data that the experiment generates would not come about other than to the experiment. Or in physics, for example, uh, and I will talk, well, maybe I mentioned briefly, uh, the well, next point is actually um, is the, the Large Hadron uh, Collider in, in Switzerland and France. No? And you think of it, this is a huge construction, a huge experiment, costs billions of dollars, it changes the, the landscape just to create data that you would never observe on Earth. So in, in a very real sense, data are talking about artifacts that don't exist. And I think one has to realize that they are the artifacts of the discourse, not biologists, not psychologists, but of physicists. And so I think one needs to see that, that, uh, that a discourse creates artifacts of a, of a tremendous range, not just text. And I think uh, it's a mistake to, to me to think of discourse always in t or just in terms of text. So there are, there are lots of devices to generate data no? and mechanisms for sharing these artifacts, journals, networks, mass-produced instruments, etc., etc. That's all part of the discourse. If you think of a medical discourse, um, the, the instruments like uh, I had to go to several uh, MRIs and so on. And these, these machines, they are produced variously and uh, distributed everywhere. They wouldn't exist without the medical discourse. So in a in, in very important sense, I think that needs to be uh, embraced when you understand, uh, study a discourse, so, or the, at least the artifacts. And that's specialized spaces for practicing the discourse. You know, think about hospitals you know, or labs for a hospital. It, a hospital wouldn't exist without the medical discourse. And, and they are constructed around that. Or I was just now in Rome a, 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 a month ago, and I was just amazed. I mean, I'm a kind of a, well, I see myself a little bit as an anthropologist walking in these churches. This is, this is, um, is an, uh, amazing spaces that simply are architectural spaces that realize narratives, the, uh, religious narratives. And, and I, I, I'm not a Catholic, but I, when I ask you, know, what is this here? Then I'm getting a story of a saint who did this and the other, or a pope who did this and the other. These are all uh, narratives which are materialized in churches. And the church is the place where this, the, the religious discourse is practiced. So I think we should really realize that all, almost all discourses have spaces in which they can be practiced. And then that's also interesting to me, they're always outsiders to discourse. But from a point of view of the discourse, they need to be tailored to fit into that discourse. Uh, like for example, lawyers when they deal with clients. A client has a story to tell. And the story is just uh, whatever the story is, but it has to be phrased in such a way that you can treat, deal with it from a legal point of view. So I think that you have to, to see not individuals, but those who support or can be incorporated in the discourse, or, or uh, patients, medical patients. You know? When you go to a doctor, who you are is totally uninteresting. But what, what's your illness? If you can fit it in some, or if the doctor can fit your illness into a treatment plan, then you are someone who can support that discourse. So I think this, these are all, to me, um, uh, artifacts that are created. But last and but not least, I think that it's important that most discourses systematize these artifacts, not just a collection of artifacts. That's, for example, in physics is, I think, the, the most remarkable uh, systematization in terms of one universe. The belief that there is one universe and it must be consistent. And, it, and everything that is not consistent cannot be part of, of physics or one has to somehow tailor to make it consistent, etc. Et this is an, a tremendous belief, the consequence of which is that there is one universe, that we always talk about the universe. 
And the universe means actually universe, one version of whatever. No? And I, I think this is something, I think it's sort of somewhat oppressive, particularly when it is generalized to all kinds of other things. But I think, you know, pathologies, psychologists, they, they define a system of pathologies as they are, they are systematization of all the artifacts that they're dealing with. So these are the artifacts that uh, discourse produces. And I think every discourse produces some sort of an artifact. Mm -hmm. And then the discourse community, well, I think this, uh, uh, to me, the important is that I, I do want to resist the notion of extracting or eliminating human beings out of the, the what happens. So I think you know, certified professionals, doctors, scientists, lawyers, plumbers, you know, they are all certified in some form, and there are ways of, of um, allowing them to be part of the discourse community and excluding others. Or a, a, an important part is uh, to recruiting uh, people in the, in the discourse. Now, what you're doing as students, I think in some ways, you are in the process of being recruited to be communication scholars or maybe other kinds of professionals. The point is that you're getting actually a, a vocabulary, a, a, a grammar, a, a way of talking, metaphors that enable you to later on do kind of things. And maybe you enter this or the other discourse community. But I think from in point of like, I mean, it's a very rigid type of discourse, like physics, biology. Then you learn, as a, as a physicist, you learn slowly the vocabulary of physics, the theories and everything, and once you once you have, are pretty competent, then you are admitted to a PhD in the community, and then you can do research. So that is, I think, this is important that, that in all discourse community needs to be constantly refreshed with new people, and that that's part of the discourse. And then there are clients, and I mentioned already the customers, and so the need to support that. There's a part of the discourse community at the fringes of it. Then the issue of boundary, and I mentioned that already. I think this uh, applies to the defi definitions of of, uh, of a discourse or the, the objects of the discourse. And for example, in physics, is concerned only with providing causal explanations of an observer-less nature. I mean, this sounds very strange, but it is just precisely that. I think if you can't find causal explanations, it's not physics. And if you find, if you cannot exclude the observer, it's not objective. And I actually, in, in, in Philadelphia, I was for a long time in some sort of a uh, discussion group with biologists, ph uh, philosophers, and physicists. And there was a constant struggle between biologists who, for example, uh, were talking about the function of various parts of an organism. And the physicists said, this is all books. This is metaphysics. There is there's no physics. There are no functions. And uh, that's just, that's just the show, showing a, a difference in in, uh, in the discourse, in the objects, because physicists are not interested in, for example, asking the question, what is the function of the sun? What is the function of uh, atoms? And so this is not part of the discourse. So I think physics has a very clear definition of what, uh, what physics is, and that deals with causal explanation of an observerless uh, nature. Or medicine concerns itself with curing illnesses. And when, when you can't define an illness, well, the, the, I mean, of course, medical uh, people have also the, the conception of a not yet found <laughs> cure or something uh, when there are abnormalities, but, but they're not really interested in something they cannot cure. And so it's, it's also with, well, uh, with linguists, they're specialized in this abstraction that I mentioned earlier, which is largely from writing. And when you think of a linguist, I mean, they, they, they theorize sentences. Sentences are written. We don't speak sentences. Well, we, we may uh, speak through kind of coherent uh, utterances uh, that maybe they have some sort of a loose relationship between some sort of a beginning and end of a thought unit, whatever. But if we, if we don't speak in sentences. We don't pronounce periods. And, and so this is something very different. And, um, and then communication, I think this is, uh, I, I put this in because it's somehow it's important to, to you, I suppose. And I'm, I'm not so sure if you agree with it, and I don't care that much about it. But, <laughs> but it is, I think basically, communication deals with what mediates between people. And, and that mediation part uh, is what, what, what we look at and what we ask what are the consequences for different kinds of um, uh, mediation. And well, we can argue about this. 
But then, uh, of course, uh, uh, part of the boundary is the qualification of membership. Uh, they are, they are like uh, literacy degrees and certifications. They, they draw boundaries around the people that are able to talk within the discourse or make uh, profound contributions. And then, uh, then there are some sort of a privileged use of particular practices. So who can, who can make a scientific experiment and evaluate it? Uh, who is invited to testify uh, to, to in Congress to say certain kinds of things? This is all uh, a question of privileging particular practices. And then when you submit a paper, you come to these boundaries too. Uh, a reviewer says, this is not, this should not be published in the communication journal. Right? But that this, these are all gatekeepers that, that preserve the identity of the discourse, draw a boundary to, um, to things that are outside the discourse. And um, uh, I mean, this boundary is basically a speech act, one could say, belonging or not belonging. Or this part of it and not part of it. And that is, I think, typical for many conversations, I including in organizing conferences. And I think when I said earlier about com my communication, um, you know, suggesting a definition, I don't know. Uh, because communication is luckily a little bit looser. You know? We accept, I think, many more things. But there comes also a point, this is not communication. Or well, this should not be presented here in, this, in the ICA. And this is where boundaries are drawn in language. So, um, and I think the, 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 to me the most important part, again going back to a conversation, discourses by drawing boundaries, keeping everything inside, are self-organizing. I mean, there is no, no outside influence or very minimal outside influence on the nature of the discourse. For example, you cannot legislate in the government who is, who is a good physicist. That is only physicists decide this. Only the medical community with all of its institutions decides who is a medical practitioner, and et cetera, et cetera. So this is all that stays within the discourse. And in that sense, I think the discourse is self-organizing. And that makes it difficult from the outside to describe it or to, to, uh, to understand it. So then the institutionalization, I think, is also an important part. And I think many uh, discourses uh, have recurrent habitual practices. And these are then, it, this is what I call an institution. I mean, when they have become norms, um, regular publications, why do they need to be regular? I mean, all newspapers, think about newspapers. Why do newspapers be regular uh, when there are no news? Well, then they create news. The point is that the regularity makes for the institutionalization and, um, and the distribution through legitimate channels. Uh, or then models of conduct and conduct. Um, Thomas Kuhn, for example, talks about exemplars for science. Uh, he talks of science in a very general sense. And I like to talk about the language that is used within various kinds of sciences. They are honor giving honors to, to particular uh, scholars. These are all textbooks, uh, narratives of success. And when you, when you read articles, then you usually associate names with them. And when these uh, articles are celebrated, then you know, here's someone that you could imitate maybe or write a similar type of paper. These are all models, one could say, of a discourse which are institutionalized in certain kinds of well, m models, texts, etc., etc., And then there are standard criteria for evaluating the uh, adequacy of a discourse of, of discursive artifact. Now, for example, in behavioral sciences, statistical tests, statistical significance is one. Mm? But why should that be so? Is that true for plumbers? Is that true for medical professionals? No. So they have other criteria. Mm? And I think every discourse develops and celebrates the own, own criteria and institutionalizes them so that once you're in it, you can accept them as such and, and uh, you, you think of nothing else. Then, then, then there are courses. I mean, you think of a you know, the university uh, is full of courses that um, institutionalize the kind of things that, that need to be learned. And you have to get a certain introductory course in physics, and then you have experimental, and statistical, and theoretical courses, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And these standardize that what needs to be known to everyone. And, and, and also prevent people ultimately from deviating that far from what these standardized institutionalized processes are. Mm -hmm. 
And then there are disciplinary measures, for example, but to withdraw licenses from doctors when they don't when they misuse medicine. I mean, that is all they're, they're protective of the institution of the discourse. And then uh, I'm, I'm saying that ju discourses justify themselves. Uh, I think this is important, the, the justification to other discourses or to other people. I think a, a discourse cannot exist as isolated, even though they are autonomous and, and self-organizing, but then they need to live with other kinds of discourses. And that, for example, I mentioned already, to attract new members. And you think of, of um, why you come to study communication or physics or biology or whatever. Well, you must have read something, you must have seen something, and I think the discourse of communication is promoting itself by popularizing certain ideas that are worth studying, that, that fascinate you. And I think this is, this is a way to attract new members. I think if you think of uh, you know, maybe science or physical science or biology, well, there are lots of popular physics books around, and they, they interest people in maybe I could do something in this area. So I think uh, it is important for any discourse to maintain its respectability in the public domain. And that is, I think, a, a part of justification. Then there is a need of material support, uh, supplies, instruments, etc., etc. And it, they need to demonstrate the value of their artifacts. For example, um, in, in terms of um, in terms of um, uh, physics, you know, what's physics used for? I mean, uh, think about it. There, there seems to be no good justification, except that it's applicable, for example, in engineering, uh, space travel, and all of these kind of things. And they justify the, the discipline of physics. Um, then there are the I issues of every discourse, I think, seeks to legitimize uh, certain practices, lobby for laws. And medicine is a good, good example. I mean, the kind of intrusion of medicine in the human body is not an obvious thing. And I think there are um, constantly struggles with legality, and I think that's about abortion and so on. There are struggles of the medical discourse with, with the law, with, 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 with lawmakers. So then I think um, a very important and part actually of, of the demonstration of the value of the discourse is to collaborate with others, uh, such as physics with engineering, or uh, marketing with manufacturing, or medicine with the insurance and pharmaceutical uh, industry. I mean, they are not, uh, medical discourse in particular is very much dependent on the kind of uh, drugs that, that the, uh, the pharmaceutical industry develops. And then once they develop drugs, then the, the medical profession finds uh, the, uh, the diagnosis to treat it with them. This is, this is all collaboration. But there's, of course, also opposition. That a, a discourse fights other discourse. Now historically, I think so much of science developed out of the struggle between science and religion. And I think myself think that much of science simply has taken on some religious uh, uh, thing. For example, the notion of a universe. You know, why should there be a universe? Well, this has something to do with one God on the other side. You know, so that there, there, there are struggles between these causes, and uh, they are, in the case of, of science, resolved. I think in favor of science, but they have also taken over certain kinds of features that they're struggling with. Or they, in the uh, medicine, modern medicine, it is very much uh, opposed to the Indian uh, Ayurvedic type of medicine. Well, I wanted to say chiropractors, but this is all an interesting you know, history. Chiropractors were not part of the medical profession, but they were so cheap. And uh, insurance companies saw that, um, uh, that that some of the medical profession and med medical things can be healed much easier with chiropractors. So they started to legitimize that, and now the medical community incorporates some of the chiropractors in its own. So that this is kind of dynamics that exists between different kinds of discourses. And then uh, finally, they must be kind of afforded. That means uh, that this is. This is the question of really, what is reality, uh, to say it in a, in a nutshell. I think every discourse needs to work in some form. That means people have to have, have something to eat, the artifacts must survive, and when you think of engineers, they need to be able to build machines that do work, 
And so there is always something that you don't understand material phenomena that need to support that. And I, I, again, I'm thinking now of physics, for example. Uh, Heisenberg made, I think, a very important statement uh, saying that, you know, we observe not nature, but nature exposed to our method of questioning. I think this, this, is, this, this encapsulates a lot of things. One is, we do not know what's outside there without asking questions. Where do the questions come from? The questions come from the discourse of physics. So what we know are only the answers of questions we raise, and in some important sense, nature supports these answers. But that doesn't mean that we understand nature the way it is. And that's also where Kant says the same thing. And I put little quotation marks because he used so many words. But basically, he said also, we can reason with our experiences, but things in themselves are not knowable as such. That means the things outside are not knowable without our reasoning of our experiences or without our experiences. That is the same to me, the same thing as on uh, another level maybe what Heisenberg says, we, we can observe not nature but only that what we expose to our own questions. Oh, uh, so now, in, in that sense, physics is not about nature. It conceptualizes its objects so that it can make experiments with them. We think about the, the Large Hadron um, Accelerator. Yeah? This, this is a huge construction project in order to make experiments. It's, it does, do they <coughs> explore nature? No. They explore the consequences of their constructions. But nature is, of course, there to say yes or no. And they, they can say no, it doesn't work, your theory. But they can't say, it can't say yes. It can only afford the kind of theories that physicists create. Or biology conceptualizes actually the ability of biologists to dissect, model, and theorize functioning living organisms. I have actually a long struggle with, with, um, with a theoretical biologist named Maturana who, who thinks that you know, everything is biology. And I, I think biology is a very special kind of discourse. We have a body. And the body is not biology. Biology is the logic of how to describe a body. I think it's important to realize that we are speakers, we are doers, we are theoreticians, we are scientists. And, and so in an important sense, we are always there. But when we theorize it, that is in a different domain, that we theorize out of a particular type of discourse. So a psychotherapy, for example, conceptualizes clients in terms of uh, how it can treat mental illnesses. Actually, one of my students, you know, Maria Lena Bartizani, she spent uh, two years uh, as uh, an observer, invited uh, participants, whatever, without pay, in a clinic in Philadelphia, and she observed how uh, therapy works. By that, I mean what happens between a therapist and patient, and she had the great benefit of doing exit interviews in which, uh, and she could also see that what happened in the two-way mirror. And the, the, the amazing part of it is that, I mean, she, she well, realized it's obvious, actually. People come with problems. These problems are phrased in the language of everyday life. And now they, they come to a clinic with these problems, and one of the first tasks of a therapist is to establish authority. How why should they believe me, the patients? So there are lots of devices, verbal devices, to establish that, that this, is a, this is an authority on this subject matter. Once this is established, then it's a question of translating the story that people bring into the session into something that's an institutionalized story that can be treated. <coughs> And, and I, I cannot get into the details of this. To me, it's fascinating how that story is completely turned around into something for which there is a, 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 an identification of a mental illness, for which there are treatments. And then comes the, the coming back with these kind of stories to the patient. And the patient might not believe that. And there comes a struggle as to who, whose reality is right. <coughs> 
But the point is, therapy cannot deal with everyday stories. Therapy can only deal with stories for which it has solutions, for which it can treat, etc., etc. So this is this is psychotherapy. So I think I would say that all these causes are, in some sense, blind to extra discursive phenomena. They cannot deal with them. But I think the interesting part to me is individuals can shift from one discourse to another. So you could, as a therapist, in fact, this is part of therapy, that the therapist is also required at some point to become the patient of another therapist. So that there is at least the, the transition between one discourse and another. And, or for example, in my history, you mentioned that I was a designer, I was, before that I was an engineer, I was a designer, then I'm also a cybernetician, and there are also some sort of a, uh, I'm not so sure that I would call, call myself linguistic, linguist, but, but I, I can shift from one discourse to another, or a few discourses. And this is to me very beneficial to see the world from different kinds of perspectives. But I think the discourse itself, itself is usually blind to others. People can shift. And there are also um, in individual experiences of conflicts. Uh, for example, when people are business people and religious people, and there are conflicts between uh, being a businessman and being a member of a congregation. So that is when you shift from one discourse to another, that can create individual conflicts. And as I said, you know, I, I, I demonstrate I mean, that I can talk actually about discourses. This is another discourse, and I would not exclude myself from being from this criteria that I just mentioned. So I think what I just uh, mentioned is basically that I, I gave you these, these six criteria or six points that I mean, to me are very important in uh, understanding constraint communication, and I'm embedding them in, in, let's say, two ideals, computation on the one side and conversation on the other, and discourse is just all the things that are in between. So now I, I want to say at least why that is important to me, and uh, this kind of constructions or this kind of discourse. Now, first of all, that I think it's important to me, and I can't say whether that is for you, to acknowledge the role of language in how we understand and what we do. I think this, this to me, this is, uh, it's often neglected, and you see, you know, when people talk about things without realizing that they uh, talk, uh, that is a sign that, that they don't understand the language in which they are speaking. So I think that there is often some blindness, uh, even among communication scholars. So the second thing is that I think it is useful to me to root all social phenomena in the utterances and texts and other material artifacts that constitute them. Social phenomena, family, for example, you know, family is constructed or is, it, it, it's, is constituted in the kind of things that a family does. Uh, in, in, in sitting together for dinner, knowing who to invite for, for a wedding, etc. These are all practices which constitute a family. Now you can move out uh, of of, um, of a family, and uh, actually there is one, you know, family uh, uh, sociologist of the family, and then he starts out. There's a family, and then you start looking at what the fa how the family works within the, within the society. The point is actually you don't understand the actual practices that make uh, a family a family, and that is what I'm interested in. Uh, actually, there was one student um, who, who studied actually the social construction of the family, and uh, and she found out that there are numerous ways one one can construct family. There is the, the the official biological definition of descendancies and marriage, and then there are also other kinds of conceptions, like uh, for example, when when a nanny is part of the family and lives with that family, and people don't know the difference, or aunts and cousins and. A family is often a, a working something that is constantly constituted and reconstituted to particular type of linguistic acts. So I'm interested in social organization as networks of conversation. And in conversations, um, the, the, the notion of the organization of which they are a member is negotiated, is, is re-articulated, and then it comes to be the story that a social organization is made up of. 
So I think in a very important sense that, that, that I think social organization can best be understood in the linguistic practices that, that are um, uh, executed within it. And then another interest of mine is to show how power relationships emerge with acts of submission and claims of authority. Now, I, I said in the beginning, you know, what kind of speech acts make that, like claiming to uh, expert knowledge, claiming to speak for the absent others, etc. These are all moves of, um, of uh, knowledge, of, of, of power. But I think uh, what I'm, uh, I want to say violently opposed, but I'm not so violent. But what I'm very much opposed to is the objectification of power. That, that for example, many of the uh, well, feminist discourse and saying, well, we can talk about social construction, but power is power, and we cannot do anything about it. Or Foucault says, power is everywhere, you know, and, and does have good things and bad things, power is there. I think that's not true. Well, that power is a metaphor from physics, which is, a, as a metaphor, occurs in language, and I think we should see just where it is actually enacted and constituted and what happens. So my interest is actually just the other side, I mean, how to undo power. And I wrote a couple of papers on undoing power and, and looking at, uh, at processes of emancipation. Uh, and and for, for example, even in therapy, it's very often therapy, uh, patients come with the notion that they can't do anything. There are so many powers imposed on me and I can't do anything about it. I think much of therapy ought to be emancipation from these conceptions of not being able to do something, and that includes power. So power is, uh, is, is just one thing that I think one can is do something with, with this kind of conception. And then I think to me important is also to reveal the unequal realities of different discourses and question the imperialist truth claims. Now, for example, physics uh, I mentioned. And I think uh, when physics say this is the way the world is, I, I doubt it. I would say there are other kinds of realities, other kinds of discourses that describe maybe not exactly the same thing, but different dimensions, and they come to very different kinds of truth. And one should probably accept the possibility that there are multiple universes, not just one. And, and if you look at the history of physics, if you want, or medicine, there are constant changes in, in what what the universe is. If this is constantly changing, well, one, one can ask the question, well, is there anything there that is so fixed that one could not find uh, that, that it could change all the time? I, I doubt it. So I think this is, this is often, these truth claims of universality, I think are dangerous. And, and I personally think you know, one should be against that. So an understanding conflicts as communication across discursive <coughs> boundaries. Hmm? But I mean, there are so many conflicts. Uh, I mentioned already, like, like uh, someone who is a businessman and is also a member of religious community, and these are conflicts they get into it. But there are also big conflicts, uh, such as Palestinians and Israelis. I mean, these are different discourses, and um, and they become incompatible. They are constructed and they construct realities that are inherently or by definition incompatible. And I think if you want to understand these conflicts and maybe how resolving some of them, one has to see that how people talk about them. And, um, and what is it that they have in common? What is it that, that maybe has to be abundant in, in favor of living together, etc., etc. And then I, I think one of the things that interests me also is how discourses colonize each other. That means how they um, <coughs> impose their brand of thinking on others. Well, in the social sciences, to me, it's interesting that economics, which is supposed to be the crown of social sciences, is really intruding into so many social phenomena that once you have a causal ex explanation, that is it. But other kinds of explanation, for example, that language constitutes things, have no place. So I think th there is an element of colonization. Um, I have a lot of nursing students uh, sometimes, and they are usually fascinated people because they are, well, they deal with a very different kind of things than communication. But one of the things that I noticed and worked uh, a lot in is that the um, that nurses, and we have PhD nurses in Philadelphia, they still are defined subservient to doctors. 
Their journal papers, their dissertations are kind of mini medical medical uh, dissertations. Doing it with less funds, uh, with less equipment, and less legitimacy. But what I worked with, with many nurses, nurses have a different kind of, want to have a different kind of discourse. I mean, that is centered around helping, about aiding, about caring, about translating, if you want, the language of, of the medical profession to patients. And that's a kind of very different kind of mission. And so, I mean, whether I'm successful or not, I mean, that is, uh, this is a big task, but I think uh, some nurses at least realize increasingly that one should define a different discourse, a separate discourse for, for nursing that is simply separate from, from, uh, from the medical discourse. And actually, when you think of it, you know, nurses, they run hospitals, they do everything. I mean, it's just amazing. And from, from the point of view of who does the work, the doctors are kind of appendices, you know, necessary, but appendices. But in terms of the discourse, it's just reversed. You know? So then for me, I think it's, it's important, uh, I mean, I think myself as a, as a critical scholar. And I don't think I like the idea, for example, of Marxism, which is one theory, to use one theory to criticize another. I think that doesn't help much. But what I think critical scholarship can do is to create a vocabulary of alternatives and let other people decide w whether they can live in that. To me, that is, I think, the, the important part of critical scholarship is to create alternative realities that are potentially viable to others. And that is, I think, what, what the emphasis on language, on the, what language does rather than what it represents, is uh, enabling me. That's it. Thank you for listening. Unfortunately, the, the reality we can't change is the time, the temporal doctrine. We, uh, we do have to end here, uh, but I think you're going to be around. So I will be around, and I'm happy to entertain uh, more challenge. Yeah. Next week, Christian Sandvik from the University of Illinois will be here. The title is Video Kill the Internet Star. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll see you next week.